Now then, our first guest of honour this weekend is somebody who needs no introduction whatsoever, but I'm going to try my best to give her the best introduction that I can. You will have probably seen her face in shows like NCIS Los Angeles, Nip Tuck, ER, all of those fantastic shows, but we all know that she's the voice of Transformers RC out of Transformers Prime, yeah? Yeah! yeah. But she's done so much more. I mean, you just list the characters that this uh, actress has voiced, uh, and it's a who's who of characters. Mystique, Mira, all of these classic comic book characters. She has done so much. Um, has anybody played a little game called uh, Dragon Age? Yeah? Exactly. And even though she's just posing for a photograph, so I'm just going. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and scream as loud as you can for Somali Montana! Thank you, guys. Now, we're going to have some runners running around with some microphones in just a few minutes. So, if you've got questions, wait for it, because I get my turn first. So, Welcome to Auto Assembly, again. I am so, so happy to be warmly welcomed here, and it has been such a fantastic experience. Everyone has been so lovely. I'm so happy. I'm so sorry. So, okay. I'm going to ask you the most boring and obvious question in the world, but for anybody who, I don't know, perhaps fell asleep through my introduction or something, who is Somali Montana? <laughs> Okay, well, let me start by saying Sumali Montano normally has a slightly higher voice. I, I don't, you guys haven't met me before, so maybe it doesn't, you can't hear it, but I, the last day before I left the States, I had a, a, a voiceover session, what we call, it was a screamer, which means it was one of the, a video game session that was two hours of some pretty intense work, and I haven't gotten proper sleep since that because I stayed up all night packing and coming here and then I haven't slept so forgive me if my voice craps out every now and again I, I'm still literally like tonight I'll get a good sleep I think or at least tomorrow night but that part that part of Somali Montano is still a little a little bit uh, subpar at the moment <laughs> but who am I I've never been asked such a broad question like that. Um, I am about... Life is too short to not do things that you enjoy. The reason I became an actor about, oh gosh, maybe in the late 90s, my cousin, was a week away from her 20th birthday. I, 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 I don't mean to start off on a down note, but she, she passed away in a car accident a week from her 20th birthday. And that hit me so strongly. I had, I, I had landed a job in investment banking, which to me is 180 degrees opposite from being an actor. I mean, yes, I stood up and I gave these great presentations and you know, you know, wine and dine clients and things like that but it is nothing at all like acting. But I found myself in the job because I thought I needed to do something that I made money so that I could you know, pay my parents back for helping me go to college. But I was so, my soul wasn't satisfied. And so I realized after two and a half years of doing that, this isn't right. I'm not doing the thing that I love. And I think when you do something that you love, you you make the world a better place. Somehow, something, something good must come from it. So I left that world, and I think that was one of the, that decision kind of, I feel like epitomizes a lot about who I am. Like I, I mean, I was, I was scheduled to make a huge ton of money that year. I was, still my parents were like, you're, you're quitting? You're quitting Morgan Stanley? And I had won this coveted, the third year of my of my job, I had won. I, I got to be transferred to the Hong Kong office, which was a huge, you know, honor. And I, I, I walked away from it because it didn't feel right. So that was one of the biggest decisions of my life. And for what that says about me, 
that's, that's who I am. <laughs> and so, what was it? It was a... I mean, you live in LA now, don't yes. you? Yeah, so were you living in LA at the time, or was this... When no. you think of investment banking, I'm thinking Wall Street, New York. Yeah. So it's cross-country. I started off in New York. Oh, this is much better. I can. I don't have to talk as loud. I'll put it closer to my mouth. You would think I would know this as a voiceover actor. <laughs> um, I started off in New York, and then after two years in New York, I got transferred to Hong Kong. And it was about maybe a few months into my Hong Kong stint. I was supposed to be out there for two years. And a few months into that, I was just, I think I worked three weeks in a row of 80 to 100 hour weeks. And I was so physically, mentally exhausted. I remember literally looking in a mirror and I didn't recognize myself. I was, and I and right then and there, I was like, oh man, I gotta get out of this. This isn't, this isn't working. And so I quit and I had all these executives from the bank try to keep me because once you, you can't leave Mother Morgan because once you leave Mother Morgan, it, it, it doesn't look good for the rest of the you know, organization. But it just wasn't me and I, I took a year off and I did what most Americans I, I don't do, but a lot of you guys do, which is travel. And I took a year off and I traveled around the world and then I landed in San Francisco. And then from San Francisco, I started voiceover acting there and then moved to Los Angeles. So, when you said that, uh, you know, you wanted to be an actress, was it voiceover you wanted to do, or was it on camera, stage work? I mean, you must have had the opportunity to do it prior to going into the investment world. Um, growing up, I actually did a lot of stage work. I mean, literally, some, since I was a little kid, I remember being in the school plays, and through high school and in college, that's pretty much all I did was plays. And I never I never thought that I could do acting as a career. I just wasn't raised that way. I was raised, I don't know if there's a stereotype in the UK, but in, the, in America there is a stereotype for Asian families. And Asian families raise their kids to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, and I was supposed to be one of those. And I, so I pursued, you know, I did what I could, which was banking, and then, I don't know, along the line I realized, oh wait, this, well, there is a story behind that, but I, I did realize that I could do, I, I could choose acting as a career, but I think when I first started, I did actually intend to do voiceover to start, and the reason was, was in college, or in university, I was, I auditioned for a little play called Romeo and Juliet, and I didn't get, I got cast as Lady Capulet. I didn't get cast as Juliet, I, but at the time I was like, oh, okay, great, I'm Lady Capulet. And two people came up to me after the announcements were made, and they were so apologetic, and they said, oh, I'm so sorry you didn't get cast as Juliet. And I, I didn't understand why, and one of them finally said, well, you know, it's, because they wouldn't cast a non-white face against a white Romeo. And I was so stunned. I had never, I was like, really? I had never heard anything like that. But I think it, a little bit, it stuck it, it stuck in my head, and I, I thought, hmm, I wonder if maybe that's true. So when I chose voiceover, there was an element of choosing voiceover because I think in voiceover, it's less about what you look like, and it is, 100% about what you sound like and how you act. So I started off in voiceover, and then ironically, the on-camera world took me away for a bit, and then I kind of came back to voiceover. It's crazy, isn't it, how sometimes people forget that acting is the suspension of disbelief. <laughs> Does it, you know, it doesn't matter who you cast or, you know, what background they come from or anything like that, it's whether or not you can portray the role. Yeah. And so that must have been quite a hard pill to swallow almost, a, sort of a, a life lesson, sort of. It was, it really, it really affected me more than, more than I realized. And I, I actually, honestly, don't think I even realized as much how much it affected me until I was at Comic-Con in San Diego this past summer, or just earlier this summer, and I was on a panel about Asian Americans who play superheroes, or, or who play, write, and draw superheroes, and I was there because I, I voiced Katana in Beware the Batman, 
and we were all, all talking about these things and this story just popped into my head and I had forgotten it and I was like, oh, that really did impact my choice to become a voiceover actor and I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it is a world, we are, we are a community that is, I think, there's, there's not a, as much ego in the business, you know, I think we're a very supportive community. If I don't get the part, I'm so happy because someone else I know, or if I don't know that person, if they're a good friend, of, another friend of mine is gonna get the part. And we're just really supportive of each other in a way, I, not that on-camera actors aren't, but there's something really special about the voiceover community that I love, so. You've picked the right career choice then ultimately, haven't you? Oh, okay, so uh, let me tell you that this just happened. I, I don't know, if, are you guys familiar with the NCIS franchise? Yeah, oh, are you familiar with NCIS New Orleans? So this is a new show, it was, uh, I, I didn't know this until a couple weeks ago, it was the number one new freshman show from last year in the United States, and of course it's from the NCIS mothership. So I will be guest starring on an episode of NCIS New Orleans in the States, I don't know if it'll air here, but in the beginning of October. I just did that, I filmed that a couple weeks ago, and oh my gosh, it was, you know, it was just first class treatment, right? It was like, they, they picked me up in the biggest black limousine town car, drove me to the airport, first class, you know, plane trip. My, the suite they put me up in was literally bigger than my apartment. I, I didn't know how to feel about that. I was like, oh my God. But the point of this is that it took 15, 15 ish years from when I quit investment banking and I was so used to those perks, but they give you those perks because they know they're sucking your soul in a different way, you know? So they suck your soul and then they give you the, you know, the corporate credit card and you can do whatever you want and they give you car service and they treat you right and they do, do all these like, you know, fancy perks, but they work you to death. It took 15 years but I finally got those perks again as an actor and I told my dad, I called him from my, from my suite in New Orleans and I said, oh my gosh, daddy, you're never gonna believe this is such a wonderful experience and I told him about all the perks and his first response was, I guess you made the right decision because it came back to you. And it, uh, he said it exactly, I was like, oh! <laughs> I didn't realize it myself but he put it in such a way that I was like, wow. So, yeah, all the more I, I I stress, do what you enjoy, figure out what your passion is, and go for it. Right, we've got some microphones knocking around. If you've got any questions, go ahead and stick your hands up. Uh, right, we've got a couple already. Um, where are the people with the microphones? Ah, there we go, right? Should we have a question here from this young lady? Um, so, um, because, um, in my opinion anyway, um, your performance is RC, he, in my opinion, it comes across as one of the best representations of the, that particular character in recent history. Do you think that, <laughs> sorry, but do you think that with the increase of stronger and better written female characters like RC and others like Strawn Arm and Wingblade, do you think the increase of these female characters is a significant improvement upon the representation of female Transformers in past, in past years? Huh. Well, honestly, I think you guys would probably be able to answer that question better than me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I watched, in, in preparation for RC, I did watch, you know, Sue Blue as G1 RC. And, you know, I think off the bat, you can see how the treatment of the two is quite different. And I think, I look, as an actor, I don't, I'm not thinking necessarily exactly in the terms that you just stated. I'm looking at it like, wow, I'm being handed a character that has a lot of depth and a lot of, she's written really well. And it's a big freaking torch to carry. And so, I, you know, I look at it like, a, like an acting challenge. Um, 
I do think as you see more and more women in powerful roles in our world, I think the more important it is to reflect that in our entertainment. So I appreciate that, but yeah, I don't, does that really, that doesn't quite answer your question, but I think it, it, RC, Prime RC is definitely treated differently. I appreciate that, and I definitely look at it as, I think I look at it as an actor would, as an opportunity to create a really full, well-rounded character. And I think that, you know, the writers and the creators who, who decided to do that for RC are the ones that, you know, I'm grateful for. Fantastic. Um, well, while we're talking about Transformers Prime and we're talking about RC, let, let's talk about it. I mean, how did it come about for you? What uh, uh, it's, it's funny, you know, I, I just made the decision to kind of get into voiceover acting and within, I think within like, not, not more than four or five months, my agent sent me the audition and we get most of our auditions through our agent and she sent me the audition and I was so excited and I, I just pounced on it. You know, it, I, I, I love my on-camera acting career, but RC was the first I, I love her especially because she was the first character that I really got to dig my teeth into and was a really meaty character. So when I got the audition, oh man, I prepped the hell out of it, you know? And I knew somewhere, I, I didn't, it, it didn't formally come to my head this way, but I knew somewhere that I was up against some pretty big heavy hitters, I'm sure, for this role. And while I couldn't compete with them in terms of my IMD credits, I could compete with them in terms of how much time and prep I put into it. So I prepped the hell out of it. And I, I went in and I remember, you know, we go into our agency to record it and we have a booth director. And typically you'll record one and then you'll get feedback from the director. And then they'll give you, you know, like, oh, I didn't like how you did this. Can you do this this way? Or, you know, more energy. Or they'll give you something to work off of. And I went in and I recorded it, and I got nothing. And the booth director was just like, that's great, we're done. I was like, what? what you, you're not gonna let me do it again? And he literally said, no, that's it, we're done. And so I was so, I was so scared, but I, I was so new. I was like, okay, I'm gonna trust this guy. A few weeks later, I got the call that I got a call back. And so we go into the callback, and there's probably, I don't know how many women were there for the callback. I saw at least, you know, at least 10. But there were probably more throughout the afternoon or throughout the day. And you go into the callback, and you bring in what you did at your initial audition. And somebody had told me, you know what? They want to make sure that you can have fun. They don't want to cast someone who's not going to have fun with this. So you better show them that you can do your stuff and have fun along the way. So I remember going in and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm fun to work with. I'm fun to work <laughs> Try, trying to be all cool about it. But I was, I was really relatively new to the voiceover business. And I did my call back. I gave them two versions of RC. My, you know, what I thought, that like she could go this way or she could go this way. And they said, thank you very much. And I walked out of there not knowing. And then a few weeks later, I got the call. I remember I was walking my dog and my agent called and she's like, you got it, you're our, she, I, actually she said, hello, I'd like to speak to RC, please. And I, I was just like, oh my God! I was so uh, over, over the moon. I, just, I couldn't even believe it. I was so, so, so happy. Fantastic, okay, has anybody got it? Yeah, we've got a hand going up over there. Where are our microphones? All right, okay, we've got one. Sorry, my mistake, go on. Hi, um, I just want to ask, do you have any memories of like your favorite episode to record or even like a favorite line that you remember being like, that is the best thing I've ever had to say? The, my favorite thing, the, my yeah. favorite thing I had to say? Yeah, like your favorite episode or your favorite line to record. There are a lot of favorite lines. I don't know that I can pick one, um, but I will say, <laughs> the, I don't know if you guys remember, I forget what episode it is, it's in, you probably know, but RC's ode to G1, where she says, uh, well, Optimus had already given the key to Vector Sigma to Jack, right? And everybody's wondering, well, why did he give the key to Jack? 
it, you know, that doesn't make any sense. And and RC says, maybe what is it? It's a, he says, maybe he thinks there's you know there's more to Jack than meets the eye. And I like everybody was watching me say that line because it is it's more than meets the eye. And I, I don't know if it's said in, in in other places during the during the series, but there was I felt so much weight for some reason when I said that line. I was like, oh, please let me deliver this line right. <laughs> Um, but my favorite, I'd have to say my, a couple favorite episodes that stick out, Predatory, because I, dang, the, I mean, the, the history and the stuff with, our, with Arachnid, and I also love Partners, I actually rewatched that not too long ago, and I didn't realize that that episode was the one that was dedicated to Peter Cullen's brother. And so for that reason, that I think now kind of trumps it because not only do you see RSC grappling with some huge emotional issues like overcoming and dealing with her need for revenge against Arachnid, you see the hurt in her and you see the fight that she, I mean, she covers her emotions and the way she goes after Starscream, I, I, I don't know if you guys remember that scream, but I actually remember that scream where I like, you know, it looks like, it looks like Arcee's totally out and Starscream's got her and he's about to put an end to her and she just whips it out and she's just like, you know, this is for, you know, this is for Cliff Jumper and she just wails on him. And that release to me, it was so cathartic because as an actor, I mean, I have all the stuff in my head about the backstory and what it, what it, what it felt like for me, for, for RC to lose my partner in such, you know, in the way that I did. And it was just, I, I loved that, I loved that whole arc that RC got to go on in that episode. Yeah. Partners, right? Am I right? That is the, that is the title of that one. Oh, yeah. uh, I, sometimes I get nervous about mixing up the, the titles of the episodes. I did that at one panel, and I, I'm like, oh no, it's in print somewhere on the internet. I messed up, I messed up the title. <laughs> It'll be online. She doesn't know Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you mentioned Cliff Jumper. Uh, how did it feel knowing that you were going to be working with Dwayne Johnson, you know, in the pilot episode? I mean, for as somebody who's just gotten the role and is relatively new to it, that must have been like, uh oh. The whole thing, at the beginning, honestly, the whole thing was such a blur. I was so new to the voiceover acting world that uh, it was just one thing after another. Like, I got, I got the first script. And I was looking at it like, oh, RC line, RC line. Oh, that's another RC line. Oh my God, there's lots of RC lines in this. I, I, you know, you expect the first episode to just, you know, like maybe they're going to introduce my character. And they did not mess around. They went right in on the first episode. And then getting to work with Peter Cullen and Frank Welker and Steve Bloom and Kevin Michael Richardson it was huge. And then when they told me who Cliff Jumper was, and it was, it was one more thing on top of an already overwhelmed, like, mind-blown state. So, I was so excited. The only thing was that I actually didn't get to work directly with him. Most of the episodes we got to be recorded all together as a group, and it's wonderful to work off of each other, but Dwayne I did not get to work with. So, I, I, I do, I, I will play that. I will, like, watch that episode and listen, listen to it. And, like, it's so nice to hear his voice. <laughs> He's great. Okay, um... Let's take a well. Let's take a question from this side. Yeah. What are your fondest memories from working with the cast in Prime? Oh, there's so many. To be honest, I think there's an overall feeling of it truly is a family, man. I mean, it is. I, I've never, I, I've never experienced a family as much as I have with this Transformers cast. So that, that there's like an overall glow to the whole experience because of that. Fondest memories. Ah. God, there really are so many. Uh, you know, getting to work with Peter and Frank is ridiculous. Uh, they will sit there and just, they'll break into their, they've known each other and worked together for so long. There are moments when they just break into some routine that you think they have it rehearsed because it's so down pat and they work off of each other so well they don't skip a beat but they'll be doing uh the first thing that comes to mind is all in the family i don't know if you guys 
know that here, but it's um, Archie Bunker and his wife Edith, and they, you know, I, I forget who plays Archie and who plays Edith, but <laughs> it's this older, old, older American couple that's really like, you know, or, you know, Archie's really ordinary and Edith is up here, you know, like and they both, they both do this act, and it is classic, you know, Americana pop culture, and you just sit there and they don't skip a beat, and they have us all in the zone between just like laughing hysterically and just in awe and reverence because you know you're watching something that is coming from two of the most talented, talented people I've ever met. So there are moments like that and then there are super lighthearted moments in the booth where someone will do something that has the whole room cracking up. Miko, Tan played by Tanya Gunati, I mean, she is, she is Miko, you guys. I mean, she literally is Miko. And she'll, you know, she'll bust up with a line and everyone will turn and be like, oh my God, you are so Miko. Like, it, it's, it's so funny or something. I remember one, one episode, Darren Norris had string cheese, like two pieces of string cheese hanging out of each of his nostrils and he was swinging back and forth and everyone was busting up and, Kevin Michael Richardson sits, you know, would sit next to me, and he was always cracking jokes, and he he would always have this way of um, he would pretend <laughs> this is weird he would pretend kill himself during the episode at some point, <laughs> like just you know he would like he would you know I, I can't even try to do it, but it would be so funny because his object space work is so brilliant. Like he would, you know, he would take the glass of water and the bottle of pills and he would undo the bottle of pills and put them in his hand. And he would go through this whole routine, usually when things were maybe slow in the booth. So he would do it as an entertainment for everybody else. And I would always slap him. I'd be like, stop that. Don't play like that. You know, but he would make, it would make everybody laugh. So there are definitely tons and tons of, I, I can't, the, the string cheese one is indelible. That will, I, that you will never leave my brain. But, um, and then there are moments outside of the recording. You know, these people became my friends and several of them attended my wedding. Kevin and his wife actually sang at my wedding. And he, you know that song? I'm gonna forget it, but it's, you know, if have I told you lately that I love you? You know that song? So he sings that song in the middle of our, in the middle of our, uh, our, our wedding ceremony. And there's a musical interstitial and during the musical part, he just is freeform talking to our guests. And it's literally just like this. We're, imagine we're sitting outside. It's a beautiful like outdoor setting. And he starts talking about how he knows me. And he says, you know, Simale is like my little sister. You know, she, you know, we met on Transformers. And he goes into this whole story about how we first met. And at the very end of the music, he times it just perfectly. And you have to know my, you know, you know what Kevin looks like, you know, he's a he's a larger African-American man and my husband is not the tallest I, He's he's very fair-skinned and you know, he's very slight And so Kevin says, you know, this is how I met Sumali and at the very end of the interstitial he says and I met Craig in prison and Everybody cracked up yeah, he absolutely stole the wedding, and I, it's moments like that outside of the actual recording that to me are so special because, and it reflects the bond that we have, but yeah, I, I was so happy. He came up to me afterwards and said, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to, you know, I didn't mean to make such a thing of it. I'm like, are you kidding? To have my wedding stolen by Kevin Michael Richardson? I am so lucky. <laughs> Still getting off. <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll go on over there. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you said something about prepping up for RC. Uh, you said something about prepping up for RC by watching Sue Blue. Now I'm wondering um, how familiar you were with Transformers before uh, the actual role. You were, you said you were really excited to have RC because you liked the character, but did you know her? Did you watch the show when you were younger? Did you, how do you know Transformers before the, the job? I was introduced to Transformers, I think, like a lot of people as a kid. You know, I, it was mostly my, I, I'm an only child, it was mostly my, my boy cousins who were the big Transformers fans. I mean, at Christmas time, it would always be about, like, what Transformers they got. And I, frankly, I was like, wow, they, they were so confusing to transform. So, I wasn't as into it as a child, but then, you know, I think you, re you recognize, and when I got the audition, I, 
I don't feel like I needed to be a total aficionado on G1 to appreciate, I, I mean, the, the, the worldwide love of this franchise. So I knew that, and then as I was prepping for RC, I did rewatch, like I said, I watched some of G1, I watched some animated, but I didn't want, I, I actually didn't want to watch too much. I think I just wanted to get a history, and I did a lot of reading. I wanted to get kind of a history of who RC was in the canon, but it was pretty clear that they were doing something different with her on Prime, so I didn't, I didn't go too deep into her history as a character in the franchise, except to kind of like hit the high notes and then delve deep into what they gave me for Prime. I think we had some hands up over here. Yeah, this gentleman at the front I know has had his hand up for a while. Um, I don't know if you ever done like voiceover for a promo and commercials and whatnot, but if, if you did, what did that, what did the difference um, between recording for like commercials and promos and doing voice acting for a show? That's a great question, actually. Um, there is, there is a lot of difference in the different aspects of voiceover. I, I think every, every actor approaches it differently. Um, for me, I feel the most comfortable in animation, and I, well, animation and video games. So actually when I do the other, part, like, and when I dabble in the other areas of voiceover, whether it's commercial, I have done some promo and some narration work. When I do that side of the business, I actually, for me, ground it in some level in a character that I'm familiar with. That's just how, that's just kind of how I work. Not everybody, not everybody does that. So, uh, in the States, I'm, I don't, do you, does Subaru sell cars everywhere around the world? Do you have Subaru cars here? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yes, oh, we're getting yeah. nods from the okay. audience. Yeah. So, I'd like, for example, I'm I'm the voice of one of the car brands and for Subaru, and even that, and so though it's a commercial campaign, in the back, I, it it's it always starts with a character for me. It's that um, it's just what I feel comfortable with. I don't know whether that's because that's the way I was trained as an actor. You know, I I, I love grounding myself in a character. When I ground myself in a character. I'm so much happier. If somebody tells me to just be Somali, uh, I get really, I get really nervous. <laughs> Which they do a lot. They're just like, just be yourself, just be yourself. I'm like, no, 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 it doesn't work that way for me. I need a character to put around me, and then I feel, and then I feel most at home. Uh, we've got a question over here, Katrina. First of all, I would like to. Um say that your performance in Prime was uh, just amazing, yeah, and um, I, would, I wanted to ask, uh, weren't you ever embarrassed um, for screaming or, um, you know, in, uh, there were other people in the, in the room you were performing, I think, weren't you ever embarrassed to um, say some lines or screaming and stuff like that? Like that? Was I ever embarrassed to, let me make sure I understand that, was I ever embarrassed to scream or say certain lines in front of such a big group? Yeah. Hmm. I don't think I would call it embarrassed, but when you are in the room, and I like to call these guys titans, I think they are truly titans of the business. When you are in the room with people that are so experienced and so accomplished and so talented and so nice, I think, Rather than em embarrassed, it, for me anyway, it kind of really stabs me with a sense of like duty and challenge to try to hit as high a bar as they have set. So not embarrassed so much as, yeah, super challenged. I mean, I would, I, I'm the short, I, besides the kids, I think Andy, Andy Pessoa, who plays Raph, and Tanya are physically shorter than I am. But other than those two, I think I'm the shortest one amongst the Autobots and the Decepticons. And I would literally have to like stand there and I would, I would stand as tall as I possibly could. And I, I mean, I, I took a stance because these guys are so huge and they have pipes and the air that comes from really deep. And I think I had to like summon that 
but I think it comes from more of like, a, all right, I'm gonna take this challenge and try to rise as high to the occasion as I can. Yeah, I've got a gentleman here. Uh, if you could voice Aussie again, would you do it? Oh, hell yeah. In a heartbeat. She... Oh, thank you guys, thank you. She, when you play a character like this, and especially I got lucky to play her as long as I did, these, the characters live in you for some, it, I mean, for me, she really lives in me somewhere, you know, and it's like, to get to visit that again, even when I see clips or anything like that, it, it, it moves, it stirs something in me, because I, you invest, as an actor, you invest a lot into the, these characters, and so, in a heartbeat, I'd love to take her out and play with her and, you know, and, you know, kick butt with her and, you know, she's, she's, she's fantastic. She's truly, truly one of my favorites. Uh, got a question over here? Hi. Just wondering, it, when you mentioned that episode in Partners before, and that was the one that I was thinking of, where um, RC really lets rip. I was just wondering, in, in times when you have to do that, because that sounded like real emotion, real anger, is there an experience, maybe from your own life, that you draw on to bring that emotion out? I'll tell you, the, this is, every, every actor will probably answer this differently, but the way that I do it, and I can't get into details, but I literally, I have RC's backstory from her happiest childhood memories to, you know, some of the most difficult things she's gone through, losing her partners. I built those memories in my mind. So it's a combination of drawing from that. And when I say I built those memories into my mind, I mean, I, I remember the smell of the room, you know, when I was watching, you know, watching my partner get tortured. Like, I, like I, I, I just, I kind of go, you know, I describe that. Those are the, those, those are the prep steps that I take. And everybody's different, and some actors will probably be like, oh my God, Sumali, you do that. But it helps me to inform moments like that, because I don't, I can't get to that place if I haven't in my mind and spent the time creating not just the, the difficult moments, but more importantly, the happiest moments, the best moments I had with Cliff Jumper, the best moments I had with Tailgate. Because if you don't create the good stuff, when the bad stuff comes along, there's not, you don't feel the loss, you know? So to me, it's like, I love, I mean, I, you know, I'll tell my husband, you know, when I'm prepping for something, like, sorry, babe, I gotta go into the other room, I'll go into my office. And he knows I'm just, I'm just sitting there, it doesn't look like I'm working, but I'm sitting there, like, you know, trying to recreate a memory of, you know, in this case, you know, maybe something that RC, you know, what, like one of RC's happiest memories on Cybertron. Uh, here's, an, here's an instance. I mean, I have in my head some of the greatest times that I've spent on Cybertron so that when Jack and I went to Cybertron and I saw it completely demolished and I say to him something like, you know, I, I didn't want you to see my home like this. It's because in my mind, I've, I, I know what it looked like before, and I, I paint those images for myself. And to a small degree, I will, just in case those aren't working for me in the time of the boot when I'm actually recording, I will think to myself, what is this situation like in my real life too? Just in case, that's kind of like a backup, kind of emotional primer. So, you know, when, no. you got it. <laughs> I'll stop talking. <laughs> Um, um, Sumala, I was wondering, uh, what was it like working with Gina Torres, you know, as a rep? How was I'm, it like, you know? I am so glad you asked that. <laughs> you guys, she, she is amazing. I mean, she walked, I got to, the, I remember I got to the studio first, and when, when I, I mean, I knew it was going to be Gina Torres, and first of all, my husband, who introduced me to Firefly, uh, like was like, please, 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 can you take the DVDs? And please, please, please have her sign them. I'm like, baby, I can't do that. You know, like, that, that's not cool, you know? I can't do that. But I had seen Firefly, and I had like, I was all, like, I was all excited to meet her. 
she is a force. I mean, she walked in there, and I talk about like needing a stance to kind of summon up the strength to play with all the big guys in the room. When we recorded, when we did, when we did that, ep the first episode, Pred Predatory, I think is, is her first episode. It must have been. I, one of the big episodes, the very beginning, it was just the two of us and Josh Keaton, who played Jack. And it was just the three of us. And I remember there was a whole other thing that she, her intensity and her strength pulled out of me because and she, she was intimidating. She walked in the room and I was like, oh, oh, I got to beat her in this episode. Okay, remember that. I do end up winning in this end. <laughs> she is, she's a force. I mean, she is fantastic. And she's, she knows, she knows her stuff. I mean, she just walked in there and she just delivered. I and mean, it was really fun because rarely was, was there an episode with that few characters. So we all had a lot to play with. And I remember in the booth afterwards, behind the glass where all the producers and writers sit, after the record session, there was a moment of celebratory, like high fives and stuff, because I think we all felt, we all felt great about what happened that day, you know, between the writing, and you know, it all comes to a, a nice culmination when you actually voice it, so. And then of course, when it, when it airs, but I hope that answered your question. Did your husband ever get his DVD signed? No, he didn't, and I don't think he'll ever forgive me for that. And I, I like, oh, now I, now I just, I have to wait. Hopefully, there will be another job where I get to meet her again, and at least I can say then. My husband wanted me to get it signed, and we, we actually just started rewatching Firefly not too long ago. And I, I he said, you, you should have got those signed. He said, I'm like, I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> What do you like the most about RC? Appearance-wise or character-wise? Anything. What do I like the most yes. about RC? <sighs> well, I think we talked. We talked a lot about. I mean, hopefully, it got through how much, how well-rounded I think she is as a, as a character. I love that. Um, I mean, I, I think in a word, it's. Oh, I was talking to one of the someone here when they were in line for um, getting something signed. I love that she's a warrior. I mean, I, I truly think all of us can relate to that to some degree because we all have our we all have our troubles in life. We all have our fights and our battles that we fight. And I think she is a true warrior. She is strong. She is tough. She is loyal to her team. And she's flawed. No one's perfect, you know, she's flawed. She gets angry and she, you know, you know, she sometimes acts before she think, you know, she acts without thinking and it gets her into trouble, but she learns from it. I think, I mean, being a, that, that to me is being a warrior and just kind of keeping, keeping up the fight, no matter what comes. Uh, we've got a gentleman over here. Hi there. Hi, in terms of, um, sorry, when, when you're recording uh, a voiceover for, for RC, um, in terms of character development, how much input and how much uh, flexibility is there uh, in terms of working with the script and with the script? Is, is, has there ever been a point when you've disagreed with the way the character's been, uh, going? How much sort of power essentially do you have in terms of that character development? Do you ever get a point where you think, I would have done this way? Is my character. I think at my stage of the game, uh, it, not much. Like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't question that that much. I think you know, I was really lucky. The writers truly gave me such good stuff to work with. So I don't think I ever really pushed back. There might have been an instance where you know, the, what's cool when you record is that they watch you, and I tend to be a very physical actor. They watch you, and they there's even a, you know the, the artist is there. He's drawing. I think what's you know taking notes about what what our faces are doing, so that after we record, he can transfer. So you have all these people watching, and I think they can tell if a line comes out and it doesn't quite feel right in the body. They may even know more than me, and they'll they'll see it, and they might say, "Hey, try it this way. Tweak this word or that word." But it's not like 
you know, like Peter Cullen has done Optimus Prime, you know, he can say to somebody, you know, Optimus wouldn't say this, <laughs> but for me, I never, I never felt like I had to, I was never in that position because I feel like what I, what, everything that I got always felt right. And I think they're, they, it's a nice, even though it's unspoken, it's a nice collaboration because they see what I'm bringing to the table. And then I think, you know, they have their ideas of where the story is going, but they can tweak what RC says based on, too, like what they see, how capable I am to, you know, deliver their work, so. Uh, yeah. How did you feel when Prime was coming to an end? You know, when when you got the last scripts. But... I'm still in denial. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's years already after it's done, and I'm still in denial. <laughs> no, we were really sad, but we we knew, you know, we knew it was coming, you know, and. Yeah, it was just, it was sad. I think as a family, we had kind of gone on this journey and things had happened. We had, you know, cast members come in and then, you know, when certain cast members, when their characters died or left, like it was, it definitely affected us. And that last, the last recording, it was weird because we weren't all there at the same time. I don't know what happened, but I don't remember us all being together. It was kind of like a half cast and then and I think there was another recording session where there was the other half, but... Oh, we were so sad. I mean, we were so, so sad. But I took my cues from the other guys because they've been doing this. It was my first series. So I think I had the extra, extra kind of emotion behind like, oh my gosh, this is my first big job and voiceover coming to an end. And then on top of that, like, you know, just the show itself and with these wonderful people coming to an end. But the big guys, I know they felt sad, but they all they also know that there's there's something else around the corner, you know, and you just gotta trust and wait for that thing to come and you know. But it was it was really special. It, I, all of us, I'm sure, would say that that special feeling, that bond that we created between the cast and the crew can't it will never be duplicated. Um, I've got one quick question that I want to ask, just in regards to the way you approach roles. You've said obviously that you invest yourself, you dive in, you, you create this backstory for yourself. So when it comes to something like, say, Dragon Age, where it's not a predetermined outset as to what's going to happen, you might have a situation which completely contradicts what your interpretation of that character. How do you approach something like that? Well, I think the good part, about, and this is true, you bring up, it's a really great question. If you've, this is at least how I was taught, if you've done the work and you've created a rich character in your mind, when the director tells you, no, 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 we want to take it this way, it's, it's actually easier for me to make that turn because I have a, I feel like I have a good foundation to turn from if I didn't have that foundation, even if it's 180 degrees wrong, which hopefully it's not 180 degrees off, maybe it's just off, you know, 20, 30, 45 degrees or something like that. But even if it's further off, there's, there's a knowingness that you create when you craft a character. So it's okay. And that's, that's one of the things I love about video games, which is different than animation. You go in and you have no idea Sometimes you don't even know the characters that you're voicing and they'll be like, okay, now you're gonna play a Russian badass. And you're like, oh, okay, let me pull out my Russian. And, you know, and, you know, and now you're gonna play a, a high-pitched alien tree. Okay, <laughs> you know, and so you don't have the time to prep, but if you have your, if you have your kind of go-to characters as your foundations, you can kind of go to them and then mix and match, like I'll take this this quality from RC and maybe mix it with this quality from Cali, from Skylanders, and not, you know, and create something else. Right, okay, we've got about five minutes left, unfortunately, so let's take one or two more questions. Um, we've got a gentleman at the back here. Hi, how's it going? Great. Right, uh, I'm not sure if uh, this was asked at the beginning, because I just missed uh, the start of your panel, but... I just want to know what your thoughts were on female characters in Transformers with uh, 
Well, with your work on RC and the sudden emergence of other female Transformer characters coming into the franchise as well, I just want to know what your thoughts were on it. More. I, I like to think people think this way, that the whole franchise, the whole canon is, you know, is elevated by strong characters, period. And yeah, the more female characters you see, you know, variety is the spice of life. I, I think we are stronger for it. I, I mean, as a fandom, as a, you know, as a people, that kind of diversity helps because it, it all all the different perspectives I, I just I just that's just that's how I think they, they can't be a bad thing they, they can only lead to good things so more that's what I say more 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 yep um, with the voiceover um, in the way they being uh, um, greatly being surprised with video games and animated series and anime, it, would you be interested in expanding to other genres of voiceover like anime in general or more what? It's anime? very interesting that you mention that. I cannot tell you definitively right now, but um, this was not planned. I, don't, I didn't know that you were going to ask that question, but follow me on Twitter and maybe in the next week or two I'll be able to announce something that speaks directly to your question. <laughs> but yeah, in general, uh, work is work to me. I mean, as long as it's not some, like, you know, pornographic, you know, uh, you know, something like that. I, I love it all. I think work begets work. I'm not one of those people who, you know, poo-poos anything, because I think uh, there's always good to be found in whatever it is, and it's up to you to find it sometimes, and, but I, yeah, I, I love it all. Any kind of acting work, I'm like, yeah, bring it on. Because I know that if I dive into it, it'll only lead to good things. Okay, one more question. Who's going to round out this panel for us? This gentleman in the front is brave enough, I think. Hi. Just wondering what um, Callie was like to work with. Who was like? I'm sorry. Callie. Callie? Yeah. From Skylanders? Yeah. Oh, okay, I got a story for you. You know what my audition was for Callie? One line. One line. And the description for her character was half a page long. And I was like, oh my gosh, what do you do with one line, right? So I, I, <laughs> I actually created three lines out of it. So I gave a pre-life line, and then the actual line that they gave me, and then the post line. And... Somehow they cast it, I and mean, I was so I felt so lucky. I love Callie because she represents to me like I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Skylanders franchise, but it is just pure, good, clean fun. I mean, it, it's it's so nice, especially when you're you know I do a fair amount of video games that are you know pretty hardcore, shoot 'em up, you know, and Skylanders is so sweet and so fun and. Callie is just, she's high energy sass to me. Uh, I'm trying to think of what the, the actual line was. I think it was something like, you know, you're not so bad when your foot's not in your mouth or something like that. <laughs> I can't remember exactly. But it was literally just one line. And that's when all of that character work, not that I went to huge lengths on her, but that's when all that character work goes, comes in handy to kind of infuse that line. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm going to take another question, or no. no well, was there something you... I just, I, I literally, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. This has been such an amazing con, and the feeling at this, the feeling at this con is fantastic. The energy here is so positive, and so happy, and so, so kind, and so generous. So I, I wouldn't be here without fans who enjoy this this franchise and I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Thank you for welcoming me. You guys should be giving applause to yourself. 
Well, on behalf of everybody, I just want to say thank you for coming and giving us such a wonderful panel. Ladies and gentlemen, give out one more big round of applause for Somali Montano. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is such an honor. And I look forward to meeting the ones of you that I haven't met yet. Please come over to the table. I'd be happy to sign something for you and I look forward to meeting you.